like I'm gonna say anything. Okay. <laughs> Hang on, I gotta send a text message. Oh. I'm working on it. Can I start talking? I have. Y yes, you can start now. Okay. Lost well, I was actually asking her, but thank you, Nick. I appreciate card. it. Credit card. Okay, it's we're gonna go. Uh, red. <laughs> she's a really <laughs> slow texter. Holy crap! Um, all right, so this is Own the Con. We've been doing this for nine years. Um, uh, I think it, we think it's novel. I'm not sure it is, but um, we like to think it's important. Uh, we try to be as transparent as we can about the conference because there's lots of good things that we'd like other people to be able to replicate and do in other places and learn from us. And there's lots of bad things that we would encourage you not to make the same mistakes that we make. So we try to provide you with as much information as we can about everything from how we choose uh, talks to our financials and that kind of thing so that you can learn from us and go forth and do other things. Uh, we know ShmooCon is popular. Uh, we appreciate everybody showing up, but we would encourage you to make other events that are popular as well uh, because we're really not in this for the ego or the massive amount of time that it takes out of our Januaries. Uh, we're in it to try to make the community better. So anything that we can do, um, we try to do to make the community better and we encourage you to be a you know, productive part of that. So um, anything to add? Yeah, tell me how to get to the next slide. Hit, hit space. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so we are not a nonprofit. Uh, that was a conscious decision. Uh, we created a company, uh, Shmoocon Logistics LLC, uh, incorporated in the state of Maryland. Uh, we try not to make a lot of money on this. That's not why we do this. But um, we found it much easier to just be a for-profit company that doesn't try to make a profit as opposed to being a non-profit. Um, although Jack explained there's this fancy thing that's somewhere between a for-profit company and a 501c3 called a 501c6. 501c6. Um, which apparently has the characteristics of some of both sides of that equation. So um, we're not going to do that, but uh, <laughs> um, but it does exist. It does exist, and if you're thinking about doing something like this, uh, look at the uh, 501c6 stuff because it may be uh, a happy middle ground for you without all the weird and heavyweight requirements that you have of the 501c3. Uh, but if you want to create an LLC, you can go to the company corporation and click a few buttons, and for 100 bucks and some filing fees, you too can be your own company. Jack. If anybody wants to be talked out of being a 501c3, <laughs> I will do that at like, any time. So, so to repeat the question for the sake of Nick, because he's walking <laughs> toward you with a microphone to hit you in the head. Um, if you, uh, uh, for those that are listening, um, uh, Jack will talk you out of becoming a 501c3, uh, not even involving alcohol. He'll just tell you bad things. Um, oh, and I should note that part of the purpose of this talk is to capture this for posterity. So we may kind of blast through a bunch of information if for no other reason that we want it captured so other people can learn from it later. Um, so as much as we're talking to you, we're also kind of talking to ourselves. Know, so next year when we need to remember something, I go back and I look at these slides right. and I watch that has the happened. Indeed, actually. Yeah, frequently. Um, anyway, um, uh, organizational structure. So uh, the Schmoo Group, which ostensibly um, kind of runs ShmooCon in some sense, um, is very loose-knit. We're scattered all over the planet, um, and we primarily communicate through email. Uh, we don't do uh, IRC or anything like that. Um, you know, originally, actually, uh, Beetle uh, ran the show. Uh, Beetle's up here um, as a, a posthumous uh, I, you're not dead, though, I guess. I can't say posthumous. Um, and uh, the reins got handed over to Heidi a number of years ago. And so Heidi's really the one at the front of it. Um, and she handles email really well. Um, and that's how we do 90% of our communication. There's no IRC meetings. There's no big Skype phone calls. There's not a lot of production. There's not a lot of drama. Um, I think our experience has been when talking with other folks, um, con organizing can be drama horrific if you let it, um, but it's often better just to have a person at the helm of the ship steering um, and have that person just kind of coordinate and let people do their jobs. Um, and we found that works out a lot better than trying to you know, kill it by committee. Um, so that's really good. Also, um, we should note, um, because this is maybe evident, but we haven't stated it, uh, people, we have a Twitter account. It's a diode. Uh, it's not a circuit. Uh, we tend not to answer a lot of questions via Twitter. Uh, it doesn't work very well in 140 characters, and often our response is, is if it's critical, just email us. Uh, so please, if you have feedback, email it to us. If you have questions, email it to us. You can tweet us things, and we sure do appreciate it, but we probably won't respond to it. So um, unless it's something like Shmookon, your hair's on fire, and then, you know, life safety issues. That's actually, for the, how many people know the guy named Shmoo? 
There's actually a dude named Shmoo. Um, he's a, a wonderful person. And um, <laughs> well, I, I'm afraid he may watch this later, so I'm gonna couch this, but I've instructed my, my offspring uh, that their uncle Shmoo, uh, you should only listen to him in times of life safety. Uh, if it's something like, get out of the way of that truck, you should do it. If it's anything else, don't listen to Uncle Shmoo. Um, and that's kind of how we treat Twitter. So anyway, uh, <laughs> next slide. <laughs> Shmoo's going to kill me for that one. Um, do you want this over there? Yeah, I can't see it because okay. there's, there's Evian between us. That's a song, right? There's, there's what between us? Evian. Evian? Uh, water. Evian? Let's just say water. How do you pronounce that? <laughs> God damn it, don't do that to me. <laughs> like, I believe stupid shit, and I always believe that. Um, <laughs> so next year we're going to be back at the Hilton. Um, uh, we like it here. We've been at the Warburton Park Marriott. Uh, we tried the Hyatt last year. Um, for our size, this conference uh, facility works out really well. 2,000 people can move relatively freely, but you still see all the people all the time kind of thing. Um, so we're pretty happy. There's some oddities about it, you know, this football-shaped space. Uh, this is the only official presidential hotel in D.C. Uh, any guesses why? Reagan got shot. Not, well, no, it was the official presidential hotel before Reagan got shot here. And it's funny because it's actually tied into that, except the opposite. This hotel is designed not to get shot at. Um, there's a lot of things, there's no line of sight. There's very few places in this hotel where you have long distance line of sight, so it makes it very safe if you're trying to protect people. Um, Reagan, go outside. Reagan decided at the end of an event, he was just going to go outside, and it turns out there's line of sight outside, um, <laughs> and he got shot. So um, this is where the official, the only official presidential inauguration occurs at the Washington Hilton. So very famous people have sat in your same seats and done things that are probably more interesting than this. So. Um, we also like it here because there's lots of side events. We try to have a lot of side events to keep folks occupied besides just the talks, and this is very uh, good space. People ask about the dates. Uh, how many people bought the World Tour t-shirt? Um, if you looked at the dates in the back, there's some statistical variance there, um, like from the second week of January to almost the end of March. Um, it actually kind of depends on when we can get a hotel, uh, what our personal lives are like, whether or not uh, our children getting a new president, that getting a new year. president that year, if our children are going to have another birthday. Um, uh, we, we, they seem to every year, um, uh, but we have one in February, one in April, and we try not to collide with birthdays. We try not to collide with holidays because it gets in our own way. Uh, this year, like except for those many years we were on Valentine's Day. Yeah, we're on, Valentine's Day is a made up holiday, so it didn't count. Um, Oh, so, um, but like this year, you know, we run this out of our house with the assistance of a lot of people and we kind of celebrated Christmas on the 24th and by the end of the 25th, we were full throttle on ShmooCon again and just kept going and it's really like get up in the morning, work on ShmooCon, go to bed. Get up in the morning, work on ShmooCon, go to bed and it starts about a month ahead of time. Um, Heidi does it, um, you know, professionally. She, this is her job. I run a company and thankfully I can't fire myself um, because I would have every year that ShmooCon comes up because I basically disappear for a month because all I'm doing is this. So um, it's a lot of work, and so we try to still have a personal life. That's why the dates float a little bit. So sorry. Um, speaker selection. So uh, we had 182 submissions this year. Um, Nothing. I'm laughing at myself. I oh. say things like wee bit, and then I type them so everybody else can see them. Too. There, there's a wee bit? Oh, a wee bit. A wee bit from last year. Okay, a wee bit. Okay. Um, so we had 75 talks come in before the early birds uh, selection, so um, not quite half, and that's better than last year. Last year we did not have many talks come in before the early bird cutoff. Uh, we only accept four talks for the early bird, so statistically you don't buy yourself a lot getting in early, but you make us really happy because we can review talks early. Um, we use a software system called OpenConf. Uh, which there's a free version, which gets you a lot of functionality. You can get the for pay version, which we did, uh, which gets you uh, more functionality and allows you more flexibility when sending out uh, acceptance emails and the opposite of acceptance emails. Uh, we don't like to say you were rejected. We just like to say you weren't accepted. Um, right? Yes. Yes. Very gentle hand with that. Um, there is a dedicated selection committee, uh, about 15 people. We have a, uh, two co-chairs at the front, and then everybody else just kind of is a free-for-all to review whatever they want. Uh, some conferences, I know um, 
uh, like CCC in each track. They'll have people who are responsible for vetting papers in a particular track. Um, our track definitions aren't that concrete, so we tend to have things that can show up in multiple tracks, um, and so we don't really divide it up like that. Uh, we just kind of tell people, review what you're comfortable with, um, and sometimes we'll have talks with six or seven or eight reviews, and sometimes we'll have talks with two or three, and we have to go solicit and say, hey, somebody else needs to review these so we get an important number. So um, thankfully, we don't ask for full papers but we do ask for enough material that takes quite a while. I mean, it's tens of hours to review all this. Like I, every year I've reviewed every paper for the, the last five or six years and it's probably 40 hours of work to do it. Bruce likes everything. I do, and it's funny, because like, I should do a statistical analysis of how I rate the papers, because as the night goes on and I've had a few beers, I start to get higher and higher ratings, and then I'll actually usually comment like, it's late, I've rated five in a row that we must accept, I'm going to bed. You know, and that's my justification for letting the paper in. I'm like, yay, happy. Um, and so then I wake up, and if I read in the morning, I'm grumpy, and you get, ah, fuck you, and no. <laughs> um, so some more stats. Uh, so our acceptance rate is uh, was about 19% uh, this year, um, except when you include the plenary. So our plenary session at the end is a little bit different than uh, a lot of other uh, places. Uh, we look at the um, kind of corpus of submissions and try to find a common thread between a number of them, like, hey, four or five people submitted on this uh, kind of same general idea. We're just going to glue them all together and make a talk out of it, uh, which is a little presumptuous on our part to be like, hey, guys. Your talks didn't really make the cut, but if we glue you together with three or four other people, then it'll make the cut. What do you think? Please. Please. <laughs> and so far, everybody said yes, but I'm waiting for somebody to be like, up oh, yours. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's worked out pretty well, and I think we've had some very interesting talks uh, um, over the years by, by doing that. So um, with the plenary and the alternates and everything, we got up to about 20, uh, 22%. Um, we try to just look at names and make a guess on male and female breakdowns. It looks like there's probably... There's a whole separate slide on this. Yeah, but you're jumping ahead, aren't you? No, you put it right there. Oh, psh, never mind. Damn it. Um, and people submit based on talks. Uh, Bring it on, which is kind of our catch-all, and it historically hasn't had a lot of talks submitted against it. Had, uh, what, 40% of the talks submitted against it this year, almost 50. Um, I think because a lot of people, when we got rid of Break It, they got confused uh, and didn't know what to do if they had an offensive talk. So like, oh, I'll put it in Bring It On. And so most of the uh, offensive talks got, got binned in, in, uh, into Bring It On. Well, and interesting too, you, I mean, the one track mind is really high submissions because everybody's like, oh, well, this could be one track mind too. But as it turns out, we usually pick talks that are specifically submitted to one track mind or we often pick talks that have sub been submitted solely to another track and have um, asked people to shorten their talks. Yeah, we tell them, hey, this is a neat idea, but I think it's only 20 minutes deep, so how about you do that? Um, and again, it's, it's you know, um, it's a little presumptuous, but it's what we think is important. Our talk selection process, we take a number of things into account. Um, that I think are, are maybe not unique, but every conference has different selection criteria, right? You know, if you're an academic conference, you're, you're looking at certain things like, you know, how does this advance the state of the art, uh, things of that nature. Um, we look at, you know, how does this advance the state of the art, but we also look at, have you presented this elsewhere? That's really important. Um, you know, if this has been presented repeatedly, well, that material for anyone who wants to find out about it is accessible, right? And unless there's really compelling reason why people at ShmooCon need to be, have access to this again for some reason, um, we tend to be biased heavily against things that have been presented elsewhere. Um, we also uh, uh, look for first time presenters. Uh, we really like people that have been on stage for the first time here. We like to give them the opportunity uh, to come here and, and, and do their thing, which is great. Um, and we also are biased toward code release. You know, if you're writing code, that's a lot better than just getting up on stage and ranting. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it, when you look at why we've chosen certain talks, it may not be, hey, this was the best write-up. There are plenty of good write-ups, so we just didn't think we're in our wheelhouse or weren't in our mission, weren't part of the thing that we were trying to do, and so they, they don't make the cut. Um, Charts and graphs, charts and graphs, uh, it, it keeps going down. I mean, obviously, a 20% acceptance, it's not like we're hurting for talks, but I think there's a lot of security conferences I've noticed, um, a lot. Uh, and so I think that, uh, you know, we're seeing a little bit of a saturation in this space where people are submitting to lots of places. And while, again, we're not hurting, I know there are other organizers who are like constantly like, man, we got to really push to make our numbers. So um, it's tough. Um, and we're thankful, very thankful that people uh, submit as many talks as they do. Um, this is a really complicated chart and graph. Uh, it's 
cut colors. Oh, so this is uh, hardware versus miscellaneous versus offensive versus defensive. Um, and you'll know we actually had a fairly even balance this year, including the hardware talks. And historically, we haven't been a huge venue for our hardware talks, but we're getting more and more of that kind of thing. So um, here's our distribution by gender. Again, this is just an we don't ask people your gender when they submit. So we attempt to do something along the lines of look at names, try to Google people and see if we can figure out if they uh, identify as male or female and uh, you know try to keep track of that. So what we see is less than 10%. We had about 16. 16 this, 16 year. this year that were submitted. submitted and I think six accepted, six uh, women accepted. Um, so you know I'm not entirely sure what the ratio is in InfoSec, but it's uh, um, you know, it, it's a male-dominated industry, certainly, and we're trying to pay attention to this and, and um, understand our role when it comes to, to gender inequality. So um, we're tracking it. If anyone has suggestions, we're certainly open to it. Um, how to hack the selection process. First, follow the damn directions. Now, I want to be clear here. Our directions, um, I'm fairly convinced, could be followed by a middle schooler. Um, we provided uh, sample CFPs. We provide all kinds of uh, website. I mean, there's a, there's a go to the page. It spells out exactly what to do. Go to this website, fill in these blanks, structure your CFP like this, and hit submit. And people still do things like, oh, here's my submission, and they email it to us. And we're like, we use a web-based system. You just have to go in there to this exact information and hit submit. And for some reason, you read everything except for the part where you're supposed to go to the website. Um, that's infuriating. And it's difficult because we get 100 and some odd submissions. You know, So we tell people, like, you have to go submit this. We're not going to do it for you. Please read the directions. Um, the sample CFP response helped this year. We, I wrote up something that was hey, here's a talk idea. And I went through all the stages of the talk um, and, and tried to you know, document it to the depth that we expect. We don't want a paper. Or we, we don't ask you to write a paper ahead of time. We don't ask you to have all your research done ahead of time. But we need enough information to be able to make a cogent uh, assessment of your submission. Um, you know, because it, it has to be more than a couple of sentences, right? I mean, you may you may think it's a simple idea, but if you're only willing to invest a couple of sentences of time to write it up, we're only going to invest a couple of seconds to reject you. Um, like, really, it's it's difficult uh, to uh, accept a talk that the person wasn't willing to put in the time to put together basically a simple annotated outline and a reasonable abstract in bio. And I get bios can be cute, but God help me, don't give me like. Bruce is awesome as the bio, and expect that you're going to get bonus points for that. Um, you know, it, you really have to put a little bit of time Do you into want it. To talk about um, barcodes or what? Barcode offer, ticket offer. Oh yeah, the ticket offer. So the dirty little secret for years that we exposed last year is if you submit a talk and you get rejected, uh, if you don't get accepted, if you don't get accepted, uh, you get what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't have to do the research. That's that's. Woo! <laughs> uh, you get actually an opportunity to buy yourself a barcode to get access to the con. Um, and so uh, last year we had a talk submission of uh, something to the effect of how to troll the conference selection. It was a couple years ago, and it was this guy, right? It, it was. <laughs> I think I think Adrian submitted a talk. It was funny. Adrian submitted a talk with um, I don't know 55 co-authors. <laughs> Yeah. The, 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 the write-up for the, I mean, there were more authors than the actual write-up of the talk. It was basically just, give us tickets, we know we failed. And we're like, oh. <laughs> so, so we knew the cat was out of the bag, and so we made the threat uh, that this year coming up, uh, we were going to do it based on merit. And if your uh, talk uh, uh, submission was just completely out of right field, was really poorly structured, didn't make, you know, just didn't make any sense, uh, we weren't going to offer you a ticket. And um, so it turns out this was really hard. It we, was uh, hard. We had we had discussions. Yeah, it was a fun <laughs> night in the Potter household that night. I will tell you what, figuring out where that cut line was, it was not obvious. Um, because, I mean, so here's the deal. We don't want to necessarily, again, we want new people to come speak, right? So you can't bias it against things that were kind of like, well, people have already done this or whatever. Like, you're not, you know, you put together a well-structured thing, but it's kind of a 101 talk, so we're not going to give you something. Like, that's a penalty. Like, you got somebody in college who's just getting involved in this. They're trying really hard, and they want to do it. Like, you want to reward that person. Person, right? And then the flip side, you get somebody who's really well known in the community who just like poops out a freaking thing and you're like, just because you're who you are, you don't necessarily get a ticket by, you know, taking a crap on our CFP submission. So, um, no names. Um, <laughs> pooping and barfing has been a theme for me this weekend. Uh, Jesus. Hi, Mom. <laughs> 
yeah, anyway, uh, glad my kids watch these things. So um, when we really sat down and looked at it, there were only a handful, like seven or 10? Yeah, so ultimately for this year, we, the only people we didn't award tickets to or were the opportunity to buy a ticket to were the people who didn't follow directions. Yeah, the people who just straight up didn't follow directions. Like if you, if you missed whole sections, like you're, you're, you had, like somebody had an outline section, it's like I'll supply an outline later. Like when could you let me know? <laughs> like maybe before we review. Um, so people that didn't follow directions, we didn't give tickets to. If you put together at least a well-structured, you know, seemingly well-reasoned submission, we gave you an offer. That's not necessarily going to be the case in future years because we may be a little bit clearer about that so we avoid, avoid strife in the Potter household. Um, but at the end of the day, of the 182 submissions, you know, whatever, 30 of them were accepted and then the other 100, and, another 140 got an offer to buy a ticket. And our uptake on that was, uh, it was like 60%. 60%, which is about the same we have every year. You know, a lot of the speakers that submit, if they don't make it, they're like, yeah, I'm not going to show up. And we get some that are obviously like corporate submissions. They're not necessarily sales pitches, but they're people you can kind of tell, like, this is their product and whatever. And you get the sense you're going to offer them to buy a ticket. They're going to be like, nah, not going to go to this hacker con thing. So um, also, please, please, God, spell check the name. Um, put Shmoocon in your actual dictionary. And it only has one C, and it's before the O-N. And the C is capitalized. Yeah, and the C is capitalized. I'll give you, it's OK if it's not. But like, don't spell it like school. It's not S-C-H-M-O-O. -O. Uh, I'll get people who like will email me at my work account and be like, I tried to email at your personal account and it bounced. I'm like, what was it? And they'll be like, G-Dead at S-C-H-M-O-O. -O. I'm like, you fail for a variety of reasons. Like, just <laughs> stop it. All right, next, sales. So the cart did well this year. <laughs> the load balancer didn't do so well. Um, so uh, we wrote this. Oh, I C forgot about the load balancer. Yeah, you didn't put that in. It's OK. <laughs> um, we have the C++ single threaded thingamabob that runs um, as part of the uh, um, uh, light H or it uses light HTTP as its front end. It's basically like a little library that's attached to light HTTPD. It's literally a single thread. It's a, it's a, it's a FIFO. People say, you must be biasing toward X group, you know, like people that are left-handed or whatever. And I assure you, it is a single goddamn thread. It takes things in the top of the queue and spits them out the bottom in order. Like, that's what it does. It can't do anything else. We can't manipulate it any other way. I'm sorry. You can wish there was a conspiracy, but there is none. Um, that thing can handle, um, I mean, thousands of concurrent connections, no problem. Uh, we still had a load balancer in front of it to try to protect it in case it went wrong. Because if this backend origin server gets pissed off, the easiest place to kill it is in front of the origin server. Because oftentimes when the origin server is like flailing around wildly because something's gone sideways, your SSH prompt doesn't return. You know, you've, a lot of you have this experience, right? Like you're out of swap space. The enter key will get back to you, you know? <laughs> um, and so we have this load balancer in front to kind of, you know, Keep things under control if anything goes nutty, and the load balancer is a load balancer. You think of it the same way that you think of your electrical outlet. Like, you don't expect it to stop working one day, and then when it does, you're like, what the fuck? Um, so our load balancer appeared to have started to go sideways uh, months prior to the sales, but we really didn't notice because, well, people weren't beating the shit out of it. Um, and it, just really, like, the origin servers were wicked fast still, but the load balancer would just not send responses for seconds on end. Um, and we weren't really sure what was going on. There were no kernel messages. There was nothing in particular. The best we can determine is there's actually a fault with the Ethernet card itself that's failing in such a way that the kernel isn't getting any kind of notification of it, but packets are just disappearing into the ether, and then they start to get TCP retransmits, and like all bets are off at that point. So um, uh, we literally just pulled the box, um, and I decided to do something kind of silly, which was actually then use a completely different load balancing software and a completely different SSL terminator uh, and a completely different operating system. So we had to learn a whole bunch of stuff, but um, screw you, I decided to do it that way anyway. And uh, <laughs> um, at the end of the day, we blocked in the new one, we reran ticket sales, and everything worked great. So um, you know, when it works, it seems to work really well now. Um, how many people tried to buy tickets like three or four years ago when it was the grand adventure of clicking the button for hours on end? That was so enjoyable, wasn't it? You could waste half a day. Don't know if you got a ticket. We didn't even tell you if you got a ticket. You know, it was it was. It's I only that one time. I love that. That was um, honestly the one of the most stressful things I had to do in my life is wait for everyone to email me how bad a person I was. You know, because of we couldn't sell tickets. Um, I mean, we were. I mean, we're great. Um, 
so anyway, the, that, that system seems to, 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 to um, work pretty well. The load balancer is now uh, largely behaving itself. Um, we did throw in an extra step. So there is a really simple, you know, robot or human step, like one plus one equals two, nine plus one equals 10. Which um, Shmukan is this? Which Shmukan is this? Hint, it's Shmukan 10, put a 10 here. You know, it was very obvious, you know, this is not, but the, the goal here is anyone who's using the script just to get a page, they couldn't just then reserve the ticket. So they had to fill that thing out. And given how fast the window is, you know, they can't really do it more than once. Well, even from people I know real well, they're like, I swear, I reserved two tickets and I never got the confirmation. And they'd send me the URL that they, they had and on the Compatia page, they would have the value that basically says, this value is supposed to be 10 equals two, because they typed in two, think it was the number of tickets on the Compatia page, not the Compatia itself. And uh, I would explain to them, like this value right here, where it's supposed to say 10, because the variable name says, this variable is supposed to be equal to 10, and you said two, it's not 10. Um, <laughs> So because we put that extra page view in the middle, it took 29 seconds to sell out this year. So it's a lot, it's like twice as long as last year. Uh, <laughs> but Probably 10 more seconds. There, but, yeah. but, but there's an extra page view. So it's about the same amount of time. Um, uh, anyway, so there's a bunch of other stuff here. Uh, there's a lot of unique IPs. I'll let you, you read this. But honestly, it's, it's really um, one of the things that we do um, is we um, uh, will review the uh, registration cycle before we release the tickets to purchase because we want to make sure somebody didn't have a bot, someone wasn't, doesn't, wasn't doing something overtly malicious and reserved a bunch of tickets in a way that we didn't foresee happening. Uh, because if there is unfairness, we don't want the tickets to be sold and then have to revoke them because we only process credit card transactions for a small period of time each year. And if you start to have lots of refunds and you're not really doing that much business, your card, uh, the, uh, the, the merchant services people will just cut you off and say, you're doing sketchy things. And the more refunds you have, the more sketchy you are. So uh, we have this window uh, where we you know, can just invalidate things if we need to and then release all the valid ones for purchase. Um, so we do, I mean, it's that hour between the time when you reserve that until the time that you get the email that says, here's where you go to pay. You can't pay before then um, because the, the payment system doesn't know your information yet. And, and frankly, we're busy stirring through all this data to determine whether or not um, it's valid. And I know there's a lot of questions about this, like, oh, there must be a lot of bots or whatever. Yeah, there's a little bit, but they don't win. I mean, that's the whole point. What we've tried to do is build a system where the bots don't necessarily win. They don't bias it toward you. Um, and we've, I think we've done pretty well there, so. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. David, uh, Darth Nall uh, wrangles most of that for us, and he does a fantastic Long job. And, and Ben as well. And Heidi and I just sit in our house and freak the hell out. So, uh, sir. Uh, sure. So the question. Uh, <laughs> faster, Nick. So. Faster. Um, before I get to the question, I think uh, we need to have a fundraiser for Nick. Uh, maybe get him some CrossFit classes or something. Um, <laughs> dude, you see some guy severed his spine doing a CrossFit competition? Like his muscles were so strong that he actually broke his own back. Yo, <laughs> I'm in such good shape I can kill myself. Watch. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so the question is, uh, why are we doing this in-house? Um, and part of it's because we're, we're tech weenies and we like doing it in-house. Um, and honestly, we host a lot of our own services because we like having our own systems. As, you it doesn't know, mean we're good at it. It doesn't mean we're good at it, but as Ian pointed out yesterday, like, you know, when he hosts his own mail server, if someone's gonna come subpoena you and take your email, you're gonna know about it, you know, versus when someone comes and subpoenas your stuff at Gmail, you're not going to know about it or whatever hosting provider you have, you know, it can get taken and you don't have a clue. Um, so we host our own stuff. I mean, that's what we've done for years and years. A lot of us worked at ISPs. We've run servers. We've run networks. And it doesn't mean that we do. It doesn't mean we're good at it. I'm a pretty shitty sysadmin. I'll be the first to admit it, man. Like our name server, the, the init script for the name service is broken. So when the box reboots, fine doesn't start. <laughs> and so Ken went to start buying the other day. He's like, there's no init script on this box. But yeah, I deleted them because they all were broken. He's like, <laughs> How do you start buying? I'm like, name D, enter. What's so hard about that? What if it's down? You can't resolve the host. Well, then I do a who is and find the IP and I SSH the IP address and then I start buying and he just looks at me and I'm like, dude, that's what I do, okay? <laughs> In summary, I'm going to apply for a sysadmin job. If anyone wants to hire me, I'm really good at it. Um, so we do it ourselves. We have a lot of control. Um, 
and, and now that we actually have a system that seems to work, um, we're happy with it. You know, we, we don't, it's, it's not kind of changed. Original motivation too is cost. And, and, and there is the, the cost, you know, it's actually cheaper for us to do it and have our own merchant uh, accounts than it is to actually, um, you know, pay somebody like Eventbrite to do it. So there is a, a cost factor involved. Um, and, and part of it at this point is just change. You know, we have to do a lot of work every year, and if we have to, this, if we go to Eventbrite as an example, it's one more thing we have to manage and do and whatever, and it takes time. Um, and right now, if we got a system that works, it's cheaper, we're gonna run with it, so. Mostly works, mostly works. Um, so uh, our size, as you can tell, is dependent on venue. We've, we've varied uh, kind of wildly at times. Uh, we had a lot of people check in this year, um, although apparently not to the same uh, level that we had last year. We only had, what, is that like 3%, 2% people didn't check in last year, which is an amazingly low number for us. The, um, uh, there's two things that bound our size. Uh, one of them is the size of the venue and how much it'll hold, and two is the size of our house. Um, That's later. Oh, was that later? Yeah. I'll get into that later. I won't talk about it now. Um, so this year we had a total of 2,050, 2,060 people. It says right there. Oh, is it 2,016? That includes press and staff and everything else? That, that absolutely does. I should read the slides before I get on stage. So uh, that's the numbers we're at right now. No, yes. Well, we well, changed that. We discovered that if we did own the con, then the closing plenary, and then closing, uh, I wanted to hurt people by the end of it. Um, and she was usually emotionally worn out, and um, I was going to die of exhaustion. So we said, screw well, it. I think last, um, starting last year. Starting last year, we did this talk on Saturday because we realized there's no particular reason not to do it now. So we're doing it now. Um, also, we figured we would go up against Schneier and see who get the most people. We lost. <laughs> so. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Thank you for that. I hear that a lot. Um, so <laughs> sorry, Barrett, I didn't mention your uh, staff. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I don't um, even know where that's coming from. That's not even an inside joke. That's just something in your head. No, you can get them from, uh, what's that company that does on-demand printing? Cafe Press. Cafe Press. You can get anything printed at Cafe Press, including, you know, underwear. Because... That's always appropriate. Coffee mugs and underwear. That's our corporate Christmas gifts. Um, <laughs> Matt's in the room. So Matt's is Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's like, I didn't get it. People um, who work for Bruce are like, no. <laughs> so secondhand sales. We don't control what people do with their tickets. Um, uh, people get the community gets pretty grumpy when tickets go for more than their face value, and we like that. Uh, we like the community enforcement aspect of that. Um, uh, Twitter is good for that. Twitter is very good for, for shaming people who are selling their tickets for a profit. Um, honestly, we don't want to know who you are. Um, and so we already have someone pay with a credit card, so we kind of know who you are, but we don't want to be involved. It's complicated for us. It's complicated for you. We don't want to know who you are when you show up. You don't have to provide an ID, an email. Whoever has your barcode that was paid for can walk in. You can hand your badge to somebody else later. We don't care. And the whole byproduct of that means there's really no way for us to even get involved in secondhand ticket sales unless you want to give us the ticket back, and then we can broker a deal with somebody else who's on the wait list. But other than that, if you want to sell it on eBay, you want to give it to your friends, more power power to you. Um, you know, and again, we're certainly happy that the community pushes back on scalpers and things like that, and we encourage you to continue to do that. Um, you know, what we see in general, not a lot of tickets move across eBay. On the 1,800 tickets that are sold, you know, a percentage point moves across eBay. That's kind of in the noise, you know, and a lot of the stuff on eBay, even people say, I'm donating this to HFC or you know, everything above 150, I'm going to donate back to HFC or whatever. So, um, and we should note that We've been $150 for... We've been around $150 almost since the beginning. And it's almost since the beginning. We used to have tiered pricing, and then we went to a single price, and it's been $150 for a long time now. So, uh, you know, while inflation and recessions and things have occurred, we keep doing this thing at $150. Bucks, so. um, sizing, why do we say the same size? So. Um, it's hard to find space that's a little bit bigger than this in DC that's not the convention center. The convention center is a bit like the EC2 of convention space. You know, they're elastic, they can grow on demand. You can get, you need five more square feet, great. You need 5,000 more square feet, great. You can pay for it by the square foot. Everything works out. That's a pretty good analogy, don't you think? Yeah, that's <laughs> all the other side people, are like, yeah. The convention center, EC2, I get it. Um, so, um, but the convention center is, is um, not fun to be in. You know, it's a convention center. It's a giant open space, and it's not pretty, and it's not in a nice section of town. You know, we prefer to be in a hotel or something like this. So uh, it's hard to find a little bit bigger. Um, and honestly, we run this out of our house and my business, 
and um, the bags show up, for instance, and it's a freight delivery to a residential neighborhood, and it ends up in my garage. Uh, my cars are in the street because there's bags in my garage, um, and they fill everything up, and Heidi will be home while I'm at work, and UPS will show up with 25 boxes, uh, everything from our t-shirts to sponsor swag to the schmoo balls, um, and she drags it all inside, and I get home, and like you can't see into the kitchen. like It's just a wall, and the kids walk in, and are like, <sighs> I'll take them downstairs, and they start dragging boxes downstairs. I mean, and then downstairs fills up, and we just leave them upstairs. And the whole house fills up with boxes, and the garage is filled up with boxes. Is all those birthdays made them older and bigger, so they can do They can, they can, they, they, I'm, now I'm like, take the heavy one, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and it was Poor Taryn. really funny, because one of our, 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 our sons, his friend showed up, and they were downstairs playing Xbox, and they're, uh, they're doing like, trying to do YouTube videos and stuff, so they got the camera set up, and lights, and all kinds of things, being all professional. And the kid's like, can we move these boxes? Why are there so many boxes here? Why, are you moving? Like, the kid was so confused. <laughs> My son's like, it's ShmooCon. And the kid's like, I don't even know what that means. Like, why, <laughs> why are there boxes here? And then they opened it up. It's like, oh my god, they're filled with foam rubber balls. <laughs> like, like, don't touch it. <laughs> um, so honestly, again, this is a volunteer effort. We spend uh, the, the Saturday before the con, rolling the t-shirts and stuff in the bags of crap. And we invite people down to my office, and we buy them all food, and then we take six or seven hours to do all that. And it scales linearly, right? Every, if you're a hundred more people, we buy more t-shirts, and then we have to you know, roll more of them. And then the Wednesday before the con, a lot of people come to my house, and we spend... It is our house. I'm just going to say that again. I'm... Shit. I'm sorry. I keep, our house. Uh, <laughs> If I wasn't sleeping in the storage unit before, I'm sleeping in the storage unit now. Um, we come to our house and, and uh, we feed them and we give them a lot of booze and then we say, stuff all the stuff into a bag and put it into a box and then when the box is full, take the box and put it on the giant tractor trailer that's in the front and then do it again, do it again, do it again, do it again until 2100 bags are full. Go. Seven hours later, there's tears, there's blood, there are bags filled with pet cat puke. It's really terrible, um, and it's done. But again, that scales linearly. Somebody said this year, man, we got done a lot faster last year. I'm like, that's because there are like 400 people fewer last year. Like, uh, it's amazing how that works out. Um, and even our bag selection, when Heidi's choosing bags, she has to choose things like, how fast can we open this bag? That's the thing. You know, how many people have the red cooler bags? Yeah, like, people really cool, like those. But so they have snaps on the bottom that you probably don't notice, but the bag actually, when it came, the top was snapped to the bottom with a snap that was made out of the stuff that Wolverine's claws were made out of. And like, <laughs> it was freaking impossible to open them. So people are like trying, God damn, and then when you got it open, you still had to unzip it. And so like people's fingers are all bruised and bloodied and it takes forever to open the bag. That year was hell. And that was only like 1,200 people and that took us like- Well, that was ten, the year we learned that lesson. Like 10 or 11 hours that we're like, next year get bags that don't need to be unsnapped and unzipped. Uh, Velcro is good. And so you got Velcro this year. Um, it's a lot of work and it really does. And, and I'm, I, I'm so thankful. Um, you know, Heidi writes these people every year and says, can you please come and help us out? And every year people show up. And I'm amazed. Like I, you know, and and we do everything we can to make it comfortable. I seriously, food, booze, money's not an object. Packing tape, gold-plated packing tape. What do you need? Um, <laughs> you can lick it. You can lick it. Yeah. Um, yikes. So it, there was a lot of um, a, a lot of people do a lot of good work to support it, but we don't want to abuse that. So I can appreciate that you want to get all your friends here and stuff, but we have limits when it comes to this. So uh, now the fun stuff. Money. In money in, baby. Um, it's only a handful of people left to get that joke. Um, sponsorship funds, uh, 135,000. Uh, ticket sales, uh, about 232,000. So grand total of, um, well, it's, it's getting to be a lot of money. Um, this is a lot of money. I mean, it's kind of crazy, like when you think about what it takes. And we're not trying to make money. So when you go to some of the bigger cons and places where people gamble a lot of money and you pay several thousand dollars, Think about how much money that is and what you're getting for that. No offense to our friends at those other conferences, but um, it's amazing how much money has to flow through. And, you know, let's talk about, you know, this is an LLC that we run, that Heidi is the leader of, and this all rains down on our personal taxes. So, you know, this is all, we have to account for this every year. I sit down with our accountant, I go through our personal books, um, I go through my company's books, and then we go through the Schmoocon books. And it all, it's, 
glued together into one big mess and we write a giant check. It's super exciting. Um, Before we go to the next slide, I just want to remind folks that this is all back of the napkin math. I put it together this morning. Numbers, um, if anything, any of those numbers are going to go up. They're not going to go down. So um, she gets really nervous that someone's going to call her out one year and be like, no, 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 I did the math and it was really $235,000. No one's ever done that. Um, someone may after I threw down the gauntlet just now, but um, so here's the money that goes out. Um, hotel space itself. Not really space, but the hotel expenses. Yeah, that includes like AV and, and all that. Internet. Internet. So the hotel bill, not including the party, is about $40,000 for starters. That's assuming we make a room booking. So the, when you get hotel space, they cut you a deal on stuff in exchange for the people who attend booking rooms which is good as long as our rate is a good rate. And this year, for a period, our rate was not the best rate, just the street rate was better than ours. And so a lot of people booked outside our block. We um, still got credit for that. But we still got credit, but again, since we don't, they think we're a normal con. <laughs> and so um, they say, oh, just send us a list of your attendees and we'll look and see who's, who's uh, you know, booked rooms. Like, we don't, we don't actually have a list of attendees. Like, I got a handle for this dude, like. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Can, anyway, so um, you know, we do our best to try to get that. We've always made our numbers, even in spite of those kind of situations. But it's a risk that you take because if you don't make most hotels, it's like 80 or 85 percent of your commitment. You owe the difference at the street at the rate. So at 170 bucks a night, if we fall, you know, 100 rooms short, we owe 18 grand just because we couldn't fill the rooms. So then I guess we get a whole floor to have a party or something. Like I don't know if they just give us the damn rooms anyway or what the deal would be. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, the swag this year, so um, uh, programs, t-shirts, bags, all that was about $70,000. Um, and again, we donate the t-shirts so that the EFF and the HFC can get money out of the deal. Um, the programs this year were very nice, but they were also uh, not the cheapest programs in the world to get uh, um, printed. Uh, about $1,000 in miscellaneous prizes that we supply or vendors supply a lot of the other prizes. Uh, $12,000 in equipment we'll get to in a minute. Um, the party this year. <laughs> Wow. So uh, it probably around 70k when all is said and done, right? That's a that's, that's twice a, as much as any other year, by the way. It's bigger than our wedding, um, <laughs> by, by an order of magnitude potentially. Um, so I mean that includes Paul and Storm and the lighting and and then 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 the drinks. And we said we're going to provide free beer, wine, and soda. And hopefully there's not an extra zero on the end of our bill at the end of that. But I like to think that there is a finite amount of liquor that the Hilton has access to. So at some point they say, the maximum amount of liquor that you could buy tonight is X. Okay, good. As long as I know that number is smaller than like a quarter of a million dollars, I'm okay. You know, it's, Jesus. Uh, speaker honorariums, every speaker gets 200 bucks. Uh, cash or a free ticket, uh, right? Or a free ticket. Yes. Yes. And how many took the ticket? Oh, God. Um, some. Some, some took the ticket, others took the money, so we've uh, nailed statistics. Um, <laughs> Less the, than all. It turns out you can, uh, uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get into it. Anyway, uh, miscellaneous, about uh, 5,000. Credit card fees, about 15,000. So that's as cheap as you get. When you go with Eventbrite, that number would be bigger, just so we're clear. I mean, of all that, of this here, uh, ticket sales, 200, you know, 32,000. Well, some of that too, sponsorship money comes in. Yeah, oh yeah, some of the sponsored money comes in by credit card. We tried to discourage that, uh, but sometimes the uh, giant corporate purchasing systems that exist um, uh, prohibit us from staying sane and getting a check, um, you know, because we're not a real company in some of these people's eyes. Uh, one company, not to be named, uh, used a fantastic invoicing system that we actually had to buy credits in their invoicing system to have the privilege to invoice them so they could pay us. I had to spend 30 bucks to get 10 credits as if I'm in a fucking arcade to then submit <laughs> an invoice so they could pay us $5,000. I'm like, can I add 30 bucks to this? Like, oh, you'd have to do a different one and use one of your credits. <laughs> God damn it. Um, it's not on here. That was last year. Uh, event insurance. Um, we're insured. It's weird. Like. I think of all the things that someone will underwrite, and I think they, no one will underwrite this for a reasonable cost. No, it's actually 800 bucks for all you people. It's amazing. Um, last year it was 250. I mean, it just last year it was 250. I think they were confused though. That's what she was saying. They thought oh. it was 2,000 people for the whole time, like it was like three days with like you know 700 people each day. Oh, is that why it was? That's so why it was so cheap. Thank so God, nothing thankfully happened nothing last happened year. last year. 
because a lot of you were going to have to lie. Like, I was at my mom's house. I don't know where. No, no. We were playing basketball. That's what I told my mom. Question. Oh, the chandelier. We never, nothing happened with what chandelier? Oh. If you look at that chandelier, there were like a million freaking glass balls in that thing. And the really, fact that four of them broke, you couldn't. Which it really four, wasn't you know? that bad. In the end, it was not bad at all. I was way, way, way more worried about people looking up when they have any glass in their eye. And once I realized that wasn't a problem, I didn't really care. Uh, but it was, it's, the phys it's the physical injury. Like, honest to God, that's what freaks me out about this kind of thing. Like, I get nervous about the personal liability. Like, breaking hotel stuff, like, a hole in the wall, money pays for that. Like, you know, as, as Homer says, you know, uh, please doesn't put thumbs back on Marge. You know, it's just not, um, you know, if, if somebody loses a limb, I feel terrible, you know, so. Good, good, I'm glad. That is the right response. Oh, that's the right response, oh. <laughs> I was confused for a second. Um, we have to pay estimated taxes, because if you get to the point where you're making a bunch of money and you're not paying yourself payroll, they just want you to pay money ahead of time, so we have to pay oh, money ahead us. of time, or, yeah. Oh, yeah, Bruce is done already, jeez. Um, and so it was about a quarter million dollars uh, to run this thing, and that's for starters assuming the bill for the party doesn't go over 70, and it probably will. So, um, gear, um, holy hell. You know, I don't know that I finished this slide, so. Yeah, it's all right, it's we bought a lot of stuff. We bought some scanners for the, um, the um, scanning thing. Uh, the <laughs> access point stands are uh, stage light stands, and the labs folks seem to love them. So anyone that's doing like conferences and cool? standing up APs, like, man, they're like 40 bucks on frickin' no, Amazon. more than 40 bucks. No, we bought 10 of them, that's why there was so much. Forty-four dollars. They were forty-four bucks. I promise. I promise. You can go look. I got the emails. I know. Okay. It's forty-four dollars. Twelve-foot light stands, and you just okay. zip tie Maybe one them. of those numbers will go down. <laughs> we spent one hundred and fifty bucks on gaff tape. This stuff's not cheap. It's really not cheap. Like people are like, oh, I made a little gaff tape origami. I'm like, that's a four-dollar <laughs> duck, man. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> but it quacks. <laughs> So there's, number, there's money left over, plus or minus 15%. Uh, we have no idea what the party bill is really going to be. So um, I'm, I'm a little stressed. If you're pretty drunk and you're thinking about going back for another, maybe go to your room instead. Uh, <laughs> please. Please. <laughs> I, I want my kid to go to school and not have to work for the rest of his life. So, um, I mean, no, wait. <laughs> I'm, not even, I'm not sure what I even meant with that. Um, uh, we run our own network. The network went well this year, Louise. Thumbs up. It's been. We need gaffer tape. We need gaffer. <laughs> they do actually need, need gaffer, gaffer tape. tape. Oh. No, I, it's oh because you need it for tonight because we're asking you to tear down the because we're we're. Oh right. Um, are, you, are you telling me I need to send somebody or did you already dispatch? No, we went to office. Yeah, gaff gaffer tape is not something that's like carried commonly. Like you have to go to like a tar center or something. Did you lose oh. your staff badge? No, it's behind it. I'm just saying, that, that one's old. Okay. Um, anyway, we run our own network. The labs have been, uh, I think, a, a fantastic success over the years as far as the middle ground between formal training and not doing anything. You know, this hands-on, experiential learning kind of thing goes a long way. So, sir. What about when you get to the chair? We don't, so. That's pass-through. That's a pass-through. Like, we don't do it. Like, I mean, there's a bunch of stuff. We count it, and they get the money, and then that's that. So that's not really on our books. Uh, we'll make separate donations on our own, but that's not, not, I mean, that money, I mean, we buy the t-shirts and that's a sunk cost, and then you take money and then that money goes to EFF and HFC, so. Um, yeah, if we, anyway, that's a long story. Um, On-site registration uh, went very smoothly this year. I think we were averaging one every seven seconds, which is one second higher than last year when we were averaging every six seconds, but uh, we'll beat the staff and make them faster and get back to our once every six seconds. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's, it's um, for as much as uh, um, it's a little bit of a hassle to print out your code and everything, it, it tends to be very efficient. And, and we pride ourselves on having a, a really good pipeline. Uh, uh, Tam's in the registration crew and then hiding the work that she does ahead of time to plan this all is all geared around you having the ability to go beep, here's your bag, get the hell out. Um, and it works really well. So, uh, and we, they open, you were open at noon, right? We opened early, yeah. Yeah, uh, which is, which is fantastic. 
um, and the barcodes, uh, the QR codes seem to work really well. So uh, video streaming, um, again, worked out really well. 1,200 people watching yesterday, anywhere between three and 400 people watching the streams today. Hi, internet. Um, it, uh, um, we're really happy to be able to do that. I was curious. Did, oh, oh, right, because we actually watch it. We have the, so the setup, and we're happy to talk about this more if people have questions, but we have two uh, laptops. One does encoding and uploads everything to Ustream uh, through, I think, Flash Media Encoder. And then we have a second one that's a monitoring station so that, you know, as Nick's sitting there working it, he can watch and make sure the stream's coming through okay, audio levels are okay, and then answer questions and that kind of thing. Um, and so we just have, uh, I mean, we have bins in storage that are just like build it, break it, break, or build it, whatever the hell our tracks are. So each track has a box and it's got plug strips, Ethernet switches, cables, the laptops, the A to D converters and everything. So you just go, boom, it's ready. And the same with registration. Registration has monitors. They're like registration monitors only. And there's Mac minis and keyboards and all that kind of stuff in that box. And so every year uh, we can just pop them open and I can go to somebody at one of these uh, you know, work parties and say, can you take the registration box and make sure everything works. You don't have to update it. Like a registration system, those little scanners, all they do is scan it and put the result, it, it's a keyboard interface basically, and it puts the result in the web form and they hit submit. Um, or actually, I think they don't have to do that anymore. When it gets they, well, they have to enter, I think. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so, and then it just looks at the name and tells whether or not they're, they're uh, in the system and if they've registered yet or not. So, um, boop, and you're done. Um, it turns out you don't need, again. beep. Um, you don't need a new box. If you look, those Mac Minis were some of the, one of them, two of them were at least seven we years replaced, old. We replaced um, one last year. I and think. one died last year, so we have a new one. But all it needs to do is run Safari. There's no JavaScript or anything. So these boxes, we don't update. We just make sure they work, just like the projectors. If boxes of projectors, and I hand it to someone and say, go forth and fire them all up and make sure they speak VGA. And they come back and say, they all speak VGA. Put them back, put them on the truck, and they come down here and they do their thing. So. Um, we provide our own security staff. Again, uh, we rent radios from a local vendor for the low, low price of? No, I didn't, I didn't add that in. Numbers go back up. Uh, $400? $400 to rent a bunch of radios. Um, and they pick them up. We don't have to worry about them. It's real simple. If anyone wants the name of the vendor, I can't, we'll provide Metro it. Talk. Uh, Metro Talk. Metro Talk. Um, we don't make any distinction between our security staff and regular staff when it comes to how they look. So everybody gets the same shirt because we want everybody to be able to answer questions. Um, but the security staff have their own schedule and everything, and so they do their own their own deal. We uh, have overnight security from a third-party security vendor because we don't want our people to have to be doing this 24 hours a day. So we pay a local security company, and usually it's that in there through the hotel itself. Uh, they say, hey, we usually contract with company X. Okay, cool, give us a contact info. We say we need somebody for, you know, from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. for three days or whatever, and then they have somebody standing guard, and, and we manage that process. And that way we give our folks a break. We learned that lesson after a few years that if you don't have schedules on those kind of things, you're really kind of abusing your volunteers, you know, taking advantage of them. So everything from videos to security, whatever, we try to have a schedule for folks um, so that they know when they need to be around and when they can go screw off and do whatever they feel like. Um, I think all previous contests came back. Um, you know, I think in general, people have really accepted the contest as part of the, the conference, the badge contest, the smart code, you know, all that kind of stuff. I think it's worked out uh, real well for us over the years. I don't want to spend a lot of time. I do want to talk real quickly about vendors. Uh, we had 46 vendors. Give or take. Give or take. Um, including lab sponsors. So the people that provide uh, uh, equipment for the labs, uh, they, get, they sponsor labs and effectively are a bronze sponsor when they do that. But no. Ish. Ish. Um, so the, the bronze sponsorship level that we have in general, we reserve for uh, small and startup companies. We've had companies that after two or three years of being bronze were like, you get to buy a higher Look, level. Bruce hopping. Um, oh, were you all on the other Bruce's talk? Did you get confused and you're waiting, you actually meant to come to this one? <laughs> that's, that's awful nice of you. I appreciate you making it. Um, we'll be done in a second. Um, anyway. Uh, there were a lot. There were more uh, requests to sponsor than than we uh, than we had sponsor slots, which is not not unusual. Um, we do continue to sponsor, push the sponsors to do something different. We also, how many people in here work for a company that has sponsored Schmoocon? Just out of curiosity. Okay. I would encourage you next year when you're talking to the people that are sponsoring Schmoocon, ask, can you can you please do. Ask them to follow the goddamn directions uh, because it's not that hard. Um, Tries me crazy. Heidi writes a really comprehensive email that says you need to do all these things, and you'll be amazed. Like step one's like give us this information, send us your logo, and then we will get an email like 
what do we do with our logo? Or why is there a logo on the website? Well, see where it said step one, send us your logo? You didn't send it to us. We won't post it. You know what gets corporate branding people really angry? We grab random logos and post them places. So we don't do that until you send us, say, this logo, we don't do it. And then they get grumpy that the logo's not posted. So um, please, please, please follow directions. It's very important. It makes everyone's life easier and gives you a better experience. Uh, and finally, feedback, it's back. Um, Branson uh, wrangled it again. It's different. And then people have provided feedback on the feedback system. How meta. Um, We'll accept feedback on the talks as well as feedback in the feedback system and we appreciate it. We are shit out of time. Uh, questions can be taken later to registration or to the feedback form or to Twitter, but we won't answer the ones on Twitter. So thanks very much, bye.